welcome to the book launch for Stephanie Wojtovich's Morning Jewelry here at the Uniontown Mall for the PA Lit Fest. Now, I'll introduce Stephanie here and then we'll get straight to uh, her poetry. Stephanie Wojtovich is the poetry editor for Raw Dog Screaming Press. She is a book reviewer for Nameless Magazine and she is a well-known coffee addict. She is a member of the Science Fiction Poetry Association and a graduate from Seton Hill University's MFA program for writing popular fiction. Additionally, she has recently been a finalist for the Stoker Award, which is the uh, horror uh, fiction genre's highest uh, accolade, for her debut poetry collection, Hysteria. So, in introducing uh, Morning Jewelry, the book itself, I'll just give a uh, brief reading of the back cover description. About Morning Jewelry. <clears throat> the tradition of morning, uh, Victorian Morning Jewelry began with Queen Victoria after the death of her husband, Prince Albert. Without photography, mementos of personal remembrance were used to honor the dead so that their loved ones could commemorate their memory and keep their spirits close. Ashes were placed within rings and necklaces were made out of hair, and the concept of death photography, small portraitures of the deceased, were often encased behind glass. Morning jewelry became a fashion statement as much as a way to cope with grief. And as their pain evolved over the years, so did their jewelry. I've got to say that is uh, as Introductions to book descriptions go. That's uh, <laughs> that one really caught my attention. I should um, add that I am Stephanie's publisher, John Lawson of Raw well, Screaming Press. So when this manuscript came in and there was that beautiful description, uh, I personally felt like we had a hit on our hands. <laughs> uh, so Stephanie, uh, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your book? And I believe you're going to read some selections for us here tonight. So I originally got the idea for Morning Jewelry um, after I was finished working on Hysteria, which as John said was my first collection, and I wanted to do something almost completely different. Hysteria is a little blunt, a little graphic, a little bit in your face um, by terms of horror, and I wanted to kind of work on something that was a little bit softer and kind of almost completely Hysteria's polar opposite. And, in some ways that worked, in some ways it didn't, but that's kind of how Morning Jewelry came about. So I'm gonna read a couple selections from the book, and I'm gonna start with probably my favorite piece from the collection, which is called Dare I Keep the Body. <clears throat> the first time I saw a dead body, I wanted to keep it, to hold it close and never let it out of my sight. It was the most alive thing that I've ever encountered, and after years of feeling stagnant, of feeling stuck, I finally came back to life with the simple sight of his glazed over eyes. So I took him. I dragged him out to my car and placed his corpse in my back seat and drove home as if it was just a pile of groceries back there, as if it was just a bad egg that soured the smell and not the stench of his rotted flesh. But then I couldn't leave him. I wanted him with me everywhere I went, so I cut off one of his thumbs and stuck it in my jacket pocket. I fingered it sometimes, scratched and picked at the nail when I got bored, but then I wanted more of him with me, on me. I took a chunk of his hair and put it in my locket so it hung down next to my heart. I yanked out one of his molars and sucked on the tooth when I missed his taste and when I really needed my fix, when I knew I couldn't be without his touch all day. I'd sew a patch of his skin inside my bra so I could feel him on me, always close, always near. It may not have been a conventional romance, but our relationship thrived until he withered away, decomposing like a banana peel in my backyard. I buried him along with my dirty secret under the flower beds, and now I smile every time I pick a rose. The girls in my office love them. They say they bring the place back to life. <laughs> Thank you. So another, the next piece I'm gonna write is actually a poem that I wrote for my father, which was funny because he was really upset that I didn't have a piece for hysteria, <laughs> um, have a piece dedicated to him in hysteria, and so I told him I'd write one in Morning Jewelry. Um, and I called it Daddy's Little Grave Digger and kind of had a good inside joke with that when he finally read the piece. <laughs> so this one's for my father and it's called Daddy's Little Grave Digger. <clears throat> I've hated the sight of a shovel since I've been six years old. 
Dad used to make me carry it out to the woods above my head, holding it high as if it was some trophy I'd be privileged to hold. And I guess after all these years, it kind of ended up being one. A trophy of sorts, just not the kind you're probably used to. See, Dad had a bad back, so I was in charge of maintenance. I'd scope out the land, dig the holes, and chuck the bodies in their graves and cover them up before anyone knew they were even missing. I was the little girl who made dirt blankets, the girl who fashioned funeral clothes out of leaves and twigs, and the child who left markings on the trees so he could remember who and where went, who and where, went where. I was Daddy's little girl, Daddy's little grave digger, and some things never change. Old habits die hard, and now I'm digging for myself, hopefully making the old man proud as he look, looks up at me from the hole I dug, especially for him, six feet down into the earth. So the more that I researched mourning jewelry, um, the more that I started getting into a little bit of mythology, and I became really obsessed with the idea of Charon, who is the guide for the underworld that would take souls um, into hell. And I've been studying Dante's Inferno a lot, so I was really excited when I came across this because I knew the piece would be perfect for this collection. So this one is called Charon's Assistant. I put the coin in his mouth, I swear it. I did exactly as you told me to, but no matter where I placed it or how many coins I used, they disintegrated on his tongue, bubbling and boiling on his taste buds as if I poured acid down the old man's throat. It wasn't my fault. I tried to make payment, tried to send in my dues, but his body wouldn't take it. It kept spitting them out, vomiting the leftover mush in my face, on my shirt. Maybe he's afraid of boats. Maybe he's already seasick, but he refuses to get on board. No, you must be joking. You can't be serious. What do you mean I have to take him, that he's my responsibility now? What am I supposed to do with the body, with the soul? Should I just chop him up and put him in a treasure chest of silver and gold? Hope that one day he swallows a piece of eight and makes his way back to you? I don't want to be a body collector, a harbinger of souls. That's why I'm the assistant, the messenger. Tell me, Charon, what's a young girl supposed to do with a rotted corpse on her hands, especially one that keeps her up at night and won't stop screaming? So the next one that I'm going to read is Leviathan Swallows the Sun. Unconscious in the dark blue waters, Leviathan remains asleep, waiting for her voice to awaken him, to chant him back to life. Every nine months she cries as her children start to die, so she calls to him to open the skies to primeval chaos, to birth the fertility rain as he swallows the sun and brings in the storm of the sea. She lights her candles, white, red, and green, and casts her spells in the eclipse, praying to the monster, the very serpent that swam inside her and laid his eggs in her womb, that her babies would live to see another year, that the pain of death would stop hurting, and that the unborn children would stop trying to claw their way out of her, ripping her skin, her womanhood, and her heart in desperation to get back to him. And the last piece that I'm going to read from Morning Jewelry is called Sylvia. <clears throat> when she first met Sorrow, she was 24. She hurt all the time, and her chest felt swollen as if she'd swallowed a lead balloon. She was lost in a nightmare of depression, her thoughts clouded in the aftermath of a thunderstorm. Her eyes shut off from the light. She had been lost for some time, a wanderer who took the path less traveled because she knew she would be alone. Sylvia had forgotten how to feel, how to breathe. All she wanted was blackness, blackness and silence. She was laying in bed in three-day-old clothes when Sorrow swept her up in his arms like a dark prince sprung from the shadows. Cast in black, he cradled her like a broken doll, his words clinging to her like a wool blanket. His brown eyes whispered assurances as he brushed her hair with his fingers and held her as she cried. He was warm and inviting, and she burrowed into his chest, taking refuge in his arms. It felt good being with him. It felt safe. Sorrow was unlike any man she had ever met. He didn't ask why, nor did he judge her for her weakness. He merely accepted the sadness and stood by her as she battled her demons. He was no more and no less than Sylvia needed. Sorrow just was. Pain broke into her house when Sorrow went away. He filled her head with poison and brainwashed her comfort into madness. His eyes beat anger into her weary blues, and when life seemed too much, he filled her thoughts with death. Sylvia hated him. 
She cursed when he lay with her and shrugged away at his touch. He was ice and his voice made her cold. But pain had something that sorrow didn't. Pain had the ability to relate. And when they came together one night, there was no greater tragedy. Sylvia had found her partner in pain, a soul that knew what it felt like to die but keep on living. She saw sorrow during the day when the ache from her other half dug inside of her heart. She would curl up in his arms and sweat the love that poured out of his flesh. He was humid and the heat made her crave frost. She didn't want someone that was trying to save her. She wanted someone to drown with. Like Lazarus, she emerged from the darkness at night to meet her lover. Underneath the yew tree, they danced in the shadow of the moon, their bodies attached at the waist. Sylvia even smiled once, but always fell back into sorrow's arms the next morning when the encroaching nothingness consumed her. She did it because it felt like hell. She did it because it made her feel real. Sylvia might have been in love with sorrow, but she would always be with pain. Thank you. So uh, one thing that I, I couldn't help noticing was uh, this collection came so uh, rapidly on the heels of your debut, Hysteria. You seem to be a very uh, prolific author, to say the least. Um, <laughs> I was wondering about your writing process, and also um, in general, but also in particular, your writing press process as regards morning jewelry. So I try religiously to write every day, whether it's, you know, a poem, whether it's a couple phrases, whether it's, you know, 2,000 words on a story. And Hysteria was a very personal collection for me, um, beyond the fact that it was my first book, and beyond the fact that, um, like I said, it's, it's very graphic. It's, you know, I had to go to a lot of dark places um, while I was writing Hysteria. And so sometimes during that process, I was also simultaneously working on morning jewelry. Um, it was a good way to kind of take a break without actually taking a break from horror. And it let me kind of tap into something different, with, which was really refreshing because I could be working on one project and feel really energized. And when I, you know, the energy started to dwindle on that, I could you know, immediately go back to hysteria um, and kind of pick up where I, went off, where I left off. So it was really nice to kind of balance back and forth between the two. And um, that's kind of similarly what I'm doing right now with the collection that I had just finished and the new one that I've been working on. Uh, just to clarify, you're working on another collection that will be the fourth collection? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so <laughs> while um, the collection that I just finished is called How to Destroy an Angel, and this one kind of in the same vein of hysteria was very personal for me and very difficult um, to, co to come out of. So I was balancing it with something um, literary, something that's almost completely different than anything I've worked on. Um, there's no horror, there's no fantasy, it's very just straight poetry. I've been reading a lot of um, Charles Bukowski, I've been reading a lot of the beat poets, you know, William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, and I kind of wanted to work on something that I haven't done before. And so it's kind of been, it's been a challenge, it's been really fun, um, and it's been a nice, it was nice to kind of change the pace and kind of mix things up a little bit. So, yeah, there's, there's a fourth one in the, <laughs> in the works at the moment. Okay, well, as I said, you are a prolific author. <laughs> so, um, well, let me ask you this. Um, when you sit down to write, is there a process for going through and picking out what will be poetry, what will be fiction? You do uh, write short stories, and uh, I believe you also have a novel manuscript. So uh, could you sort of walk us through uh, how a poem becomes a poem? So for my poetry, I tend to work thematically, which for me is the best way to do it because it forces me to stay on task and kind of always be thinking about a certain you know, either a certain event, a certain myth, a certain, well, a certain theme, whether it be horror, whether it be fantasy. And I write, I write to music a lot, and I develop soundtracks um, for certain songs that I feel like inspire me, and I listen to that on repeat most of the time um, while I'm writing. I did that for my novel. I did that for every poetry um, collection that I've worked on. And I also, um, I have a Pinterest page where I go on and I look for artwork. And a lot of artwork um, that I find, you know, I put in my storyboards and I'll either write poetry off of that or kind of bounce some ideas around. And that's kind of how I start getting ideas um, for individual poems, sometimes for manuscripts in general. And I did that with my novel too, which was a huge help. 
because um, sometimes when you get stuck and you know you've been working with the theme for so long you kind of feel like you you've tapped your ideas at some point and art's a really good way to kind of refresh that energy to kind of refresh your ideas and music is the same way um, I'd say I'm probably more inspired by music more so than anything um, but between the two of them that's kind of how I pinpoint my ideas and kind of expand on whatever project that I'm working on well, it's very interesting that you should mention art. Um, both of your books, for instance, have very striking covers. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, showing them to the audience here, this is uh, Hysteria, the uh, debut collection, and also Boring Jewelry. Now, uh, these are both the uh, same artist, uh, Stephen Archer, and uh, were you working from an image similar to these uh, as you were uh, composing, or is this totally uh, after the writing process? So both of these were after the writing process. Stephen Archer is a phenomenal, phenomenal artist, and his portfolio um, is, is amazing. And so I've had a lot of really um, cool opportunities to kind of sit down and talk with him about the pieces and which I thought would go best. Um, Morning Jewelry was actually a piece that um, he had commissioned for somebody, and it was also called The Summer of the Drowning Girl, was what the original painting. And when I saw it, I immediately fell in love with it, and I thought, you know, this is exactly the type of, you know, motif and the type of, you know, thematic um, artwork that I'm looking for to represent my collection. Um, so Stephen didn't even have to touch anything up for morning jewelry, which was, I thought, pretty cool because we were just immediately in sync on that. Hysteria was a little bit different. Um, he had the original... Um, the original nurse that was in the gas mask, um, but the color was purp or the color in the background was purple and green, which I thought wasn't exactly dark enough for my muse of madness. So we had talked a little bit about it, and I had told him kind of, you know, I was working with the themes of the asylum, with medicine, um, you know, doctors gone wrong type of deal. And he came back after the second after the second time we talked, and he had, you know, the tiled floor. He had this scary background. He had it black and gray, and it was exactly what I was looking for. So I feel very fortunate um, to be working with Stephen because he, he gets my writing perfectly and he, he can take what's in my head and put it you know, immediately into his artwork. Okay, very interesting. Well, it just so happens that you are also yourself a visual artist. And uh, I believe we have some pieces of your, your work here uh, on the stage. Um, could, did you want to say a few words about these? So originally, when I started out as an undergraduate at Seton Hill, I was an art major. And I was art history, and I was English literature. And for a really long time, I was convinced that art was the field that I wanted to go into. And I was planning on doing my master's in you know, museum education and really being focused. Um, obviously, I, I kind of switched paths up a little bit, but I never really got away from working with art. And, uh, my art professor and I, Maureen Vassat, um, she's been an absolute wonderful inspiration to me over the years. And she originally got me painting. Um, the first painting I ever did was actually a graduation um, present that I gave to her um, after I had left Seton Hill. And I had done the same for my other mentor, Mike Arnzen. And ever since then, I've been painting like crazy. Um, and these are some of the pieces that I've done. Um, some of them are more recent. Some of them are in the, that I've done in the past. Um, but art for me has always been really inspiring because I'm the type of person that I feel like if I'm not creating something every day, I, I can feel it. I don't like to not go a day without making something. And if I feel that I'm really in a rut with my writing or if I just can't get the words to come to me that day, I'll go to art and I'll paint. And painting for me is very relaxing. It's not always, it doesn't always end well. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a good way for me to relax and kind of re-energize and recharge. And it's also why my art is mostly color. I like working, um, you know, in expressionist and surreal um, genres for art. And a lot of my work isn't even necessarily done with a brush. I use sponges a lot. I'll finger paint a lot. Um, and it's just very, it's a way to kind of literally become part of the art and get me, you know, get me where I need to be in a better place um, as I'm crafting. So, um, for instance, you know, a piece like this, um, like the two on the side here are mostly, like, I could say, um, you know, in the vein of Jackson Pollock, who was strictly, you know, a splatter painter. He would take spoons and he would take forks and he would take his hands and brushes and he would just throw paint. And 
you know, for a long time I was like, you know, is that, is that really art? Is that something that I can, you know, relate to? And then I started doing it and I realized why it was so much fun, why he became so popular, why it was you know, a good vein for him to work in because you're moving with the art, you're moving with the paint, which is a lot, you know, very similar to writing. You're becoming your characters, you're moving with the story, you're plotting, you're very involved in it, and that's kind of why I like that vein of painting. Um, so, if, yeah, so for me, art is, is a great asset to my writing, whether it's, you know, novel, poetry, short story, because um, it keeps me in the vein of creating, it gets me imaginative, and it really recharges me um, when I need it. Uh, a lot of your uh, writing is very <clears throat> highly evocative of uh, startling imagery, uh, very imagery based. Um, so uh, w would you say that your, your writing sort of uh, predates your artwork or the art first? Do they play off each other? I would say the writing probably comes first. I know um, the first thing that I do in the morning is I always, and before I even sit down to write, whether I know it's gonna be poetry or a novel or you know whatever I'm working on, I always start out with poetry. Um, whether it's a haiku, whether it's something longer, I always, I always try to start my day with a poem. And so a lot of times if I'm working with something similar, I feel like I have an idea, then the art will come after it. But writing has always been, has always been first. Um, it just, I feel like since that's where my, my real vein of passion is, that it just seems natural that writing comes first and then the art comes afterwards. Okay, and um, from splatter painting to splatter punk, how much of a leap would you say that is? Fangoria Magazine actually covered your uh, debut collection, Hysteria, and they said <clears throat> that was enthralling, but fair warning, not for the faint of heart. So when Fangoria Magazine, the uh, magazine dedicated to uh, gruesome horror films, is warning people about you, um, is that something uh, that, well, first of all, do you feel that they were wrong in that assessment? And also, is that something that you uh, feel you have to live down or live up to? I don't necessarily say that they were wrong in saying that. I think. Um I think hysteria is a little bit, it's a little bit intense, it's not, it's not for the faint of heart and I tell people that, um, especially people that tend to know me really well and know my personality, when they buy hysteria I'm like this may, this may change, <laughs> change how you look at me after you read it. Um, so I wouldn't say that they were necessarily wrong but um, yeah, his, hysteria was, was a journey, <laughs> was a journey for me. But it, it is, it is difficult because I do feel like with that being my debut poetry collection, that that is what people are going to expect time and time again. They're gonna be expecting me to constantly be, you know, pushing the envelope, making everything very, very gore heavy, very intense, very graphic, and um, that's, that's not always the case with me. It was, it was the case with Hysteria, and you know, I don't, I don't regret it. I love it, I'm very, very proud of the collection. I'm very proud of what she stands for, and she, um, you know, she kind of makes her way in the morning jewelry a little bit. There's a couple poems in there that probably aren't for the faint of heart. But, you know, I, I, I do work outside of Splatterpunk. But um, I will say that Hysteria was a lot of fun to write. And that, you know, if I was going to compare the two, I, I definitely had more fun really pushing that envelope with her. It was a good experience for sure. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I also had a, uh, a couple of uh, quotes I wanted to ask you about. That I saw that you had on your website, and I believe actually this one from Vincent Van Gogh might actually be in your book. <clears throat> I wanted to um, ask you about uh, basically what they, what they mean to you. Um, the first quote is, I put my heart and soul into my work, and I have lost my mind in the process. That was from Vincent Van Gogh. The second is from Stephen King, and you might have heard of him. Uh, I think that we're all mentally ill. Those of us outside the asylums only hide it a little better and maybe not that much better after all. <laughs> so kind of building off of those quotes, hysteria, um, even in the title, is a collection of madness. And I did a lot of research into insanity, into asylums, into mental illness, mental disease, um, a lot of different medical research pro um, operations and things of that nature. 
And it's interesting because the more that I was researching it, the more that I was questioning how, um, you know, really intrigued I was by everything. Um, and I always laugh when people ask me, you know, how is the process of hysteria? And I said, you know, I think I lost my mind while I was, <laughs> while I was writing it because I was visiting asylums. I spent, um, I spent the night twice over at the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. And I mean spent the night, got there at seven at night, spent the whole night there, slept in one of the cells, woke up at 6 a.m. and left and then did it all over again. And, you know, I did a lot of writing while I was in the asylum. I wrote in solitary confinement. Uh, there's a poem called Solitary that's actually in the book that I wrote while I was in one of the cells. And it was, it was fun, I, that's the right word <laughs> to say, um, to kind of be a character in my book. So <laughs> I would say for sure that probably translate a little bit to both of those, um, both of those quotes for sure. Um, and I also did research um, at the West Virginia State Penitentiary where I went there and I spent the night, got there probably around 10 o'clock at night, spent the night there, slept in the psychiatric ward of, of the prison and then woke up and left the next day. Um, d you know, like I said, same, same scenario, wrote a lot while I was there um, and kind of took a lot of photography and I think there's something really cool about getting so involved in the work that you do kind of get lost and kind of tap out on reality and just focus on the setting, focus on your art, and kind of focus on what you're writing. And for me, um, that was great. That was really, really exciting. Um, and that was probably the best, the best part of doing research for Hysteria. And I would say both of those quotes kind of nail, <laughs> nail it you know, right on the head um, with what I was feeling writing the book. But it was, it was great. I, I wouldn't change anything about it. OK, well, uh, here's a question that comes to mind when you mention uh, just dropping into these asylums. Um, how does one go about <laughs> falling into this uh, asylum clique or, <laughs> or what have you? How did that come about? Yeah. Okay, I should have clarified a little bit on that. So my best friend um, used to head a paranormal investigation company down in Shreveport, Louisiana. And she had moved up to PA a couple years ago. And we became friends the night that we were both staying at the West Virginia State Penitentiary, because apparently that's where friendships are born. And so we had, I had called there just because I was interested in doing um, an overnight paranormal study there. And then the more that we talked about it and the more that, you know, I learned about what she was doing with her group and she learned about what I was doing with my writing. We both kind of looked at each other and said, you know what a really cool place to be, you know, to go next? would be the Trans-Allegheny Asylum. And she's like, yeah, she's like, I've been, you know, I've been wanting to go there forever. It's definitely on my to-do list. And I was like, all right, well, let's, let's call them up and see what we can do. So we called up, the, <laughs> called up the asylum, and I introduced myself, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm working on a book. I'm really interested in spending the night. You know, I have, my friend has a paranormal investigative team. You know, they'll come, they'll do sessions. You know, you can take anything we find, you can put on your website. And we kind of sweet talk them into letting us come down and kind of explore the asylum. And we went and the tour guides were great. They walked us around, gave us all the scary stories. Um, they actually stayed with us that night and you know, we, we made a really lot of great friendships there too, other place, you know, <laughs> to build strong friendships. And um, they invited us back and they actually, by the, by the end of my whole journey with Hysteria, they had actually invited me to be a tour guide there, which is really funny. <laughs> and if I lived closer, I absolutely would have done it. Um, but yeah, for the most part, these places are just, I mean, they're really great. Trans-Allegheny, again, has just been, they've been a wonderful support system for me. And it was sim like simply just calling up and saying, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm interested in. You know, would you be cool helping out with that? And they were immediately on board. And, um, you know, when the book came out, they were, even, they were even more excited because they got to see, you know, the final product of something that they had helped create. And then they, you know, invited me back and I got to do a reading there with John and Mike and um, you know we got to tour the asylum again and it was it was a really cool way to see everything kind of come full circle from you know starting out there doing research to writing the book and then you know having a reading at the place where it all began so yeah yeah it's been <laughs> it was it was kind of funny how it how it all came together but I feel very fortunate to have worked with them. Well, you were clearly uh, very diligent with doing your research for the uh, first collection. Was there any research that went into Morning Jewelry, or was that more of an inborn process? Morning Jewelry was 
probably a little bit more inborn. I did, I did a lot of research act to see what morning jewelry was. I looked at a lot of really great pieces of morning jewelry, um, you know, from the past and from the present, people that are still working on it. I looked into a lot of interesting, um, like current morning day jewelry-esque type of processes. Like right now, they, um, there is a company over in Europe that is working on taking um, the deceased and turning their ashes into diamonds, which was something that I thought was really interesting and a, you know, a more modern day take on morning jewelry itself compared to just taking a lock of hair and you know, either weaving that into a bracelet or wearing it in a locket. So I stumbled upon a lot of really cool, um, a lot of really cool research while I was looking into morning jewelry. And then most of it was mostly just, um, yeah, from inside. I had a, I actually have a book that's called A to Z Sim Symbols. And for a while, I write my poetry based on letters, like very Sesame Street. Today's letter is A. I'm going to write <laughs> poems that start with A. And um, I was slipping through that a lot when I would get stuck on letters like Q and X, and I didn't really know what to do. And then I started getting into a lot of mythology um, with the symbols, and that led me into stuff like Charon's assistant, um, Leviathan swallows the sun. And I would kind of take those myths and kind of, you know, put them alongside the concept of mourning. So a lot of it kind of was research based, a lot of it um, was born, but that book of symbols really, really nailed it um, to helping me to kind of get everything to flow. Well, uh, did you want to read one or two pieces from Hysteria? Okay. All righty. Let's see here. Well, I will start. Um, I'll read my favorite piece from this collection, which is Blackbird. And it's actually a piece that I wrote on a dare with Mike Arnzen. We, um, <laughs> After I had graduated, we had decided to start competing in poetry. <laughs> and we would go to um, a small cafe in Greensburg called Deviate. And we decided to have a Poe down, which is a battle of Edgar Allan Poe-based poetry. And um, I had said that I was going to write a piece um, based off the Raven called Blackbird, which I'm sure nobody makes that association. Um, and so that's kind of the backstory to how this poem came about. So, Blackbird. I ask of you, can a dead soul cry? Can it weep tears of blood as it wells in the shadows of lost love and empty bottles? Can it mourn the memories of abandonment and neglect, sew up the prideful wounds of ink-spattered rejection, cast out in the dust-covered compositions no one got to read? I ask of you, can a heart still hurt after it stopped beating? Does pain fade into the ether of dusk until dawn while ravens sing their funeral songs over his rose-laden grave? Do they mock him in unison, squawking at the man who died for his heart, whose words wove madness into a definition of sanity, whose stories bled out like a telltale heart, whose metaphors tapped relentlessly at our doors, relentlessly questioning our reason, our judgment, our sobriety, nevermore. I ask of you, does a damned fear the shape of death? Does it cringe at the fluttering blackness that hangs over its head like a dark cloud in the blue sky? Does the winged beast unsettle even the deadliest of creatures, a marauder even to the master that brought it to life? Does the raven speak blasphemy, writhing with the ser serpent's tongue, eyes gleaming like a demon that is dreaming? Can it see into our souls, I ask of you? Does the feather of the blackbird bring the reaper, arms open, scythe extended, no more questions, nevermore? And the next one that I'm going to read is called Nor Nurse in Ward 1. Um, which I actually wrote in Ward 1 at the asylum. <clears throat> I like it when it rains because the air has a reason to feel cold, and I'm not constantly reminded that there are people around me, moments from death, practically knocking down the reaper's door to escape. I like it when it pours because the sound drowns out their screams, helps with the voices in their heads, and I can sit back, read on my lunch break without the moans of hungry spirits creeping through the cracks in my floor. I like it when it storms because the lights go out and I can pretend I don't see them fighting, don't hear them begging as the crazies break out of their rooms and murder their neighbors while they sleep. I pretend I'm not there because when it showers, I go off duty and I let the asylum drown.
And then I will read, let's see, the color white. White reminds me of bone, of marrow being sucked out of me on a frozen snow-covered plate while bleach is poured down my throat to cleanse me and sterilize my blood. I don't see clean, I see covered up filth, black lights on white sheets, violations and screaming impurities, crystal tears in a sea of what used to be abstinence. White reminds me of teeth, of his crooked smile and elongated canines, the absence of his reflection in my bedroom mirror, and the icy touch of his skin against my cheek. White is supposed to be comforting, but the gloved hands of the people sticking tubes down my throat don't make me feel that way. A sense of calm doesn't rush over me when I see their white jackets rushing at me like I'm a closet case who's faking an attack. White is supposed to be blissful, but it hurts my eyes and I'm sick of hurting, and I'm tired of this color being everywhere I go in this damn hospital because every time I see it, I feel the walls close in a little more. I feel his blank eyes stare straight through me because first and foremost, white reminds me of blood and the two holes punched in the side of my neck. Let's see here. And let's see. I'll read one more, and this is the first poem in the collection, and it is called A Killer Recipe. He didn't stand a chance. The ingredients were all there, mixed together, and beat with precision and love, and left to cook for 12 years. Alex wasn't born, he was created contrived meticulously from the recipe his parents followed. When he was prepped in age to about eight years, they added a spoonful of physical abuse bought locally from dad's fist and added a dash of fire and gin consumed daily underage by the young boy's perverted mind. He sat for two years and they repeated until he broke. Then dear mom and dad added a pinch of social awkwardness, picked fresh from the fields of a homegrown sociopath, and blended them together with the family's pet that Alex recently slaughtered in the outside shed. His rage was set to boil, and they waited until they saw a thick red paste about the sides of his crust before they stuck in the pick to see if he was done. His self-pity was left to cool until Alex's edges began to harden. Then during the final stage, he was topped off with a touch of the Oedipal complex as sprinkles and hate and disgust were poured into his mouth. Alex was devoured by childhood taunts and parental abandonment until the timer went off and he snapped. Perhaps his parents should have read the warning label. If tampered with, sour language and a taste for sadism may occur. If so, rinse with regret and repeat until guilt washes it away or you're poisoned from the consequences. Laura, well, uh, you've also done a lot of work as an editor. Clearly you have uh, diverse artistic influences, uh, but how has being an editor influenced you at all? Or do you see uh, yourself uh, hopping into shape or influence uh, the development of the contemporary uh, poetry scene? So being an editor has actually been a wonderful influence on being a poet for me. Um, it's been really great because I can see mistakes that I'm making um, and other things that people are doing really, really well and vice versa. The, um, the collection that I had recently just worked on um, was with a you know an, an already well-known poet, and he was absolutely wonderful to work with, and it was great because as we were working on the collection together, I could see certain instances in his poetry where I thought the image could be stronger, and then he'd look at me and say, "Steph, no, you're wrong," <laughs> and then I'd look at it again and he'd explain it, and I was like, "Yeah, you're right. I am wrong, and you're absolutely right." And we kind of we taught each other a lot about you know where poetry is at now in regards to you know free verse and, you know, being a contemporary art form and something that's being, um, you know, more widely read now. And so through doing that, you know, every, everybody that I've been working with, you know, as an editor has really helped shape me as a writer and hopefully it's, you know, it's been a good seesaw process for both of us. Um, but I feel like, you know, from when I wrote Hysteria to when I wrote Morning Jewelry, even the way that the poems are written are very different. I feel like I've kind of changed a lot as a poet um, between the two collections, and I think editing has really helped me in a lot of that. Um, I've really grown from a lot of the people that I've worked with, and I've learned a lot through that process, um, and I'm really looking forward to a couple of the manuscripts that have you know, recently come in and kind of getting to kickstart that process all over again. Um, so I feel very fortunate to, you know, kind of be able to put on the editor hat and put on the, you know, the artist hat and kind of learn from both of those positions. Well, it's always very good to interact with our peers during the creative process, but 
What about the audience, the, uh, the readers? Uh, has there been any response from your readership? I've had, I've had a lot of really um, great experiences, um, especially with hysteria. Um, people are always um, very curious once they hear that I spent the night in the asylum. <laughs> they want to hear more about that, and I'm very, very okay with talking about it and, you know, kind of, you know, telling them the process of how that's come about. And that's kind of, I think that story in itself has kind of, you know, piqued some interest with um, with reviewers, with other artists, um, and with, you know, my readers. So the asylum angle to it and the kind of the research element that I did has gotten me a lot of great, a lot of great feedback and I've made a lot of great contacts because of it um, and have gotten to since investigate a lot of really cool places. I was at, um, after Hysteria came out, I was at Hillview Manor, which is a little bit past Pittsburgh, and that's mostly a geriatric hospital. And I got to go there and spend the night there and kind of investigate their entire hospital. And they, have, they had a really cool embalming room that I wrote some cool stuff in. And um, so, I mean, that in itself has kind of kick-started a lot of really cool experiences of stuff that I never in a million years would have ended up doing unless it was, you know, because of this book and because of the contacts that I made for it. Um, so I feel, I feel very fortunate um, with a lot of the people that I've met, um, you know, that I've met through Hysteria. And while it may be off the wall sometimes, the experiences have truly been unforgettable. Um, and I, I couldn't be more excited to see where it keeps going after that. Okay, well, um, I think we're just about out of time here, so uh, I wanted to wrap up by asking you, uh, what can we expect next from Stephanie Wojtovich? So the next, like I said, the next project um, that I had just um, finished is called How to Destroy an Angel, and it kind of traces the pathway of what an angel is, um, of who an angel is, um, whether being an angel automatically places you in heaven or if it could give you a little bit of a darker background as well. And like I said, it challenges as to whether an angel is a mythical being, a fantastical being, or if it is someone ordinary. Um, so that's been my, my go-to project at the time, and I'm really excited, really, really excited about it. Okay, well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing everything with us here tonight, and I want to thank the audience for participating. Have a good evening.